Great. Well, one of the many important counterterrorism homeland security related topics that we did not cover last year in our debut forum and that we have yet to cover in any detail in this year's forum is that of terrorism finance. Exactly how is it that terrorists finance their operations and just as importantly, more importantly, how can we as a government and society counter that? And we have a superb panel to address that issue which includes two of the real pioneers in this really critical counterterrorism field. And to moderate the discussion, uh, we're very privileged to have Aaron Burnett. For those of you who follow the financial markets, and nowadays, given the dysfunction in Washington, who doesn't? Uh, Aaron Burnett is uh, familiar to all of us. She recently joined CNN from CNBC, and at CNN, she will anchor a daily news and analysis program that will launch this fall, and she'll also serve as the network's chief business and economics correspondent. Um, Aaron is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Her reporting has been noted over the years for documentaries including India Rising, The New Empire, City of Money and Mystery, The Russian Gamble, On Assignment Iraq, and Dollars in Danger, Africa, The Final Frontier. And when uh, Erin and I communicated uh, a few months ago about this, she said that she was delighted to receive this invitation because one of the many topics that she's going to cover during her time at CNN is, is that of terrorism and its relationship to finance. So we have the superb moderator for this, and I'm looking forward to it very much. And with that, Erin Burnett. Thank you very much, Clark. Well, it's great to be here. And uh, I know I've spoken to some of you. I'll, I'll do my pitch. Our show is launching at 7 Eastern, 8 Pacific in September, and we hope that many of you will be part of it. Um, now, let me introduce our panelists, and uh, we'll get going in our conversation. We're pretty excited about this one, just because we can talk all we want about ideology and hearts and minds, but without money, things sort of come to a halt. So that's where you all come in. So uh, Juan Zarate and Stuart Levy are here to talk about terror finance. And um, Stuart just left the Treasury Department where he was Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. He served under Presidents Obama and Bush, which gives him a very unique perspective on working with uh, both administrations, particularly uh, on Iran as well as other things. And Juan was Deputy National Security Advisor and Assistant to President Bush. He oversaw American counterterrorism efforts in that role and was also at the U.S. Treasury with Stewart working on terror finance. Uh, Juan was there for four years as a senior Treasury official, currently at the Center for Strategic, uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies. And I believe you're writing a book right now, right? That's right. Okay. All right. So. Um, I wanted to start with this headline. It was funny on the way out here because I didn't get out here till yesterday. And I was reading Eric Schmidt's article in the New York Times uh, when he was interviewing Michael Leiter about uh, warning against complacency on Al Qaeda, which obviously seemed to fly a little bit in the face of the Washington Post headline earlier this week that I know you've all talked a lot about. Headline on that front page, uh, top left, US officials believe Al Qaeda on brink of collapse. Um, so when it comes to money, is the he which, which, which headline is true? Are we being complacent or are they done, Stuart? Um, well, thank you for the introduction. And uh, uh, before I answer, I just want to thank uh, uh, Clark and the Aspen Institute for inviting me and uh, also to be on a panel with Juan. Uh, the last time I was on a panel with Juan was our confirmation hearing, <laughs> uh, and, which I handled by the same, the same way I'm going to handle today, which was I, all the tough questions, I would just sit and look at my notes until Juan started talking and answering. <laughs> and um, that's how I intend to handle this. Um, so I, I don't think, uh, you know, I think that's, that's actually a bit of a false dichotomy. I think, of course, uh, we've, um, we, we have to stay vigilant, as Mike, uh, as Mike Leiter said. Uh, but I do think that uh, we have put uh, an enormous amount of pressure on Al Qaeda, and Al Qaeda is in a very weak position. Uh, I, I liked what Admiral Olson said, you know, that we've gone from Al Qaeda 1.0 to Al Qaeda 2.0, and we'll have to adjust to it. That's true on the financing as well. And if I could just give a little uh, background as to what I what I mean by that, if you go back to uh, 2001 and how Al Qaeda was funding itself before 9/11. Uh, they had certain methodologies. Uh, they could openly, relatively openly uh, uh, raise money in the Gulf by descending fundraisers. They, could, they had access to money that was raised through ostensibly charitable organizations. <laughs> they had better access to the financial system and so forth. For a number of reasons over the last uh, several years, uh, that is no longer the case. Uh, there's been a lot of tremendous work done, and we now see Al Qaeda under uh, real pressure, financial pressure that was borne out by what was found after the bin Laden raid, which I think is really uh, um, 
gratifying to see that they were under real financial pressure. Uh, I think that uh, that there are a number of reasons for that. One, uh, Dan Benjamin mentioned, which is this global consensus to go after Al Qaeda and some of the great work done, uh, even at the, Uni at the United Nations. Richard Barrett, who spoke yesterday, has done uh, heroic work uh, around the world to enforce the sanctions against Al Qaeda. But uh, I don't think it's unfair to say that the United States has played the leading role on the terrorist financing uh, uh, um, uh, portfolio, and that's because of. The, the resources that we have, the commitment that we had to it, but also because uh, uh, following up on Juan's vision, frankly, to build a new organization at Treasury, and it was Juan's and others, uh, a few other people's ideas, not mine, to build something at Treasury and especially to build an intelligence function at the Treasury Department. Uh, that, is, that has uh, transformed the Treasury Department into a national security department in a way that it never was. Uh, when I think back, when I was at the Justice Department before coming to Treasury uh, and we're thinking about working on terrorist financing, basically the Treasury Department was in the position of beggar for information. Uh, and when I think about what it was like when I left in 2011 uh, from the Treasury Department, the Treasury Department has an Assistant Secretary for Intelligence, which was why, and uh, Congresswoman Harmon's uh, idea in the Intelligence Reform Act. Uh, it was uh, not just having access to all the intelligence available to the whole community, but driving the collection on, on, on our priorities and going back to the intelligence community and say, this is what we need to fight these threats. And that has enabled the, uh, the United States to be much, much more effective on terrorist financing. Frankly, as I think we'll talk about, on a lot of other issues as well, like Iran and North Korea and so forth, it all comes from the fact that Treasury is part of the intelligence community and can be a national security agency. So. I think we've made an enormous amount of progress putting pressure on Al Qaeda. We now have to, I, I, I like to think of it that we've disrupted their ability to raise money in their, uh, in their traditional ways. We now have to move to the next steps, which is to deter people uh, from giving money and to dissuade people from wanting to give money. And we have a lot of work to do there, but I think we're set up uh, in, in a much uh, more uh, constructive way. I'm gonna follow up on your point about it being a, Treasury being a security agency because it's interesting as a reporter, sometimes what we would hear out of Treasury would be, frankly, the complete opposite of what we would get out of state. And I want to just to follow up with you on that in a few minutes. Um, but, but let me ask you, Juan, <laughs> when we look at, um, and obviously I know this has come up on other panels, but the death of Osama bin Laden, the Arab Spring, uh, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, obviously in very different forms in different places, but everywhere. Um, what, what, in your view, in aggregate, uh, does all that mean for terror funding? Is it is it drying it up? Is it simply making it much more difficult to trace because it's yeah. got a billion different paths it could go down as opposed to a couple of very clear avenues? Yeah, Aaron, first of all, thank you very much. I'm so excited to be on this panel. Clark, thank you for including me in the Aspen Institute as well. By the way, I thought you should have called this panel Beauty and the Two Beasts. But <laughs> then, uh, I'm really, uh, I'm a huge fan of both That's of these That's really folks. mean to you, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Now you know why I love them. <laughs> Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, I think we're in an age of fragmented financing. Uh, and I think, as Stuart said, said perfectly here, the evolution that we've seen with Al Qaeda and associated movements and the ideology really has a parallel on the financing side. And so in some ways, you have elements of the old network that's still out there. For example, Treasury just had this designation of the uh, two funder, or funders in the Gulf out of Kuwait and Qatar with the, the financing network facilitation through Iran, into Pakistan, into Al-Qaeda core, those networks are still out there and they still persist. And so th that's in the background, but they're weakened. They're much different from, as Stuart said, what we found uh, right after 9-11. What I think is most interesting and difficult is how the movement is adapting its financing to the regional dimensions of what it's, what it's uh, confronting. That is to say, the regional groups of Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb in the north, Al-Shabaab in, in Somalia, um, AQAP, the Central Asian groups, are all finding ways of self-funding. They're finding ways of using their position, their locality, to at times tap into that old network, uh, the charities, the demanding donors, uh, the investors, but also then to form their own basis of funding. And so, for example, with Al-Shabaab movement, they control three ports, so the second most important port, port in uh, Somalia, Kismayo. They have port fees that they uh, implement, taxes. They have checkpoints that they control, taxes. They've implemented a really fascinating trade-based money laundering scheme with the export of charcoal 
uh, into the Gulf and then back in uh, with rice and sugar then sold in Kenya. So just fascinating developments with these groups that are having to self-finance, have capabilities to do it, and the wherewithal. Um, and then when you see self-motivated sort of individuals, you have people who you know, are finding just ways to self-fund, especially when some of these attacks, especially small-scale attacks, don't really cost that much. And so you know, the Madrid cell is a good example where those guys were engaged in low-level drug trafficking, financial fraud, uh, just to finance their activities. So I think we're, we're in a completely different environment. The one thing I would say about the death of bin Laden, um, strategically incredibly important, I think, uh, in terms of diminishing uh, his role as the glue to the movement, he was essential to the financing as well. He was the motivator of those deep pocket donors in the Gulf uh, who wanted to see and hear bin Laden. In 07 and 08, they were clamoring to see and hear him. Uh, and when they didn't, when al-Qaeda didn't put bin Laden out, the donations would drop. And so without a bin Laden who can demonstrate and symbolize the cohesiveness of this movement, I think that old network starts to, to atrophy a bit. And I think that's all to the good. You think it atrophies, or, or is it possible that it's there? It's got the, des the desire, and it's just looking for a new place, and then... The question is, where is that place? Where is it going to go? Well, I, I think it's still there. And I think one of the, one of the dangers and in, in sort of strategic shocks we have to watch for is, do you have a galvanizing event, a crisis of some sort, uh, that re-energizes that network? You know, I sometimes think about the, the ongoing conflicts between Sunni and Shia proxies, Iran, Saudi Arabia, the, the great Sunni Arab states against the Persian uh, power. Uh, does that in some way start to re-energize these old networks that were born out, out of the Afghan Mujahideen movement and have evolved over time? Uh, we've done quite a bit to suppress them, but there are elements of it still there. And so I think we've got to be very cautious not to declare victory too soon, because I think you still have to maintain pressure. I, I, maybe another way of say, saying this, I, I, I agree with the, the worry that you expressed, because I think that to the extent we were able to follow the, the financial stress that al-Qaeda was under, we attributed it largely to the disruption of their facilitation networks. But what we didn't know, and which I don't think we still really know, is, is whether there is a pool of, essentially a pool of money that wants to get there. And that uh, if they, those facilitation networks could ever revitalize, especially into Saudi Arabia, could, could, those, uh, could, could the, the, uh, the, the flows of money start to start to pick up again. So I think it's too early to say. And uh, you know, my my instinct is always to assume the worst and assume that uh, we haven't uh, solved right. the problem. You raised Saudi Arabia. Um, obviously, everyone saw the, the preview of the new book coming out and Vanity Fair, which we were all talking about, kind of rehashing a lot of uh, some of the, the questions out there. But uh, you had been one of the most vocal people to, to great criticism from the Saudis themselves uh, about terror financing coming from Saudi early on. Um, and you've changed your mind. And I, and I know as we were working on a, a, a piece with you earlier this year, you were uh, pretty adamant that they had done, they had significantly improved. H how so? Is Saudi really, I mean, it's, it's all relative, right? I mean, if they were bad, are they better, or are they actually not doing it? Um, well, I don't think the problem ever was, uh, you know, I I as far as we know, that it was uh, money being sent from the government of Saudi Arabia to any of these groups. The, the, the question, as you, uh, as you rightly point out, is whether uh, we were getting the kind of cooperation that we thought we could get on uh, shutting down the terrorist financing. And uh, I, I do think that it's in the, you know, looking back now over seven years, I can say it was a good news story, but there were definitely painful moments along the way. Uh, I do think that there was a great sensitivity in Saudi Arabia to public criticism on this issue. Uh, and we knew that. Uh, we also thought that that might be a way that uh, would, despite the pain, inspire better uh, cooperation. Uh, and I also think that over time, just by continuing to stay at it, we eventually uh, persuaded them to view the funding as an integral part of the overall counterterrorism mission, uh, that they uh, had not focused uh, sufficiently on the money going out of Saudi Arabia to uh, al-Qaeda affiliates, but that over time, by sharing a lot of information, continuing to stay on it, uh, we were able to, uh, to persuade them uh, to do that. And I do think that now, uh, in, in, in part because we put Treasury officials in Saudi Arabia, which I think helped, uh, that uh, it, it helped 
also, this is a little uh, maybe inside the U.S. government too much, but it also helped to prioritize that in the, in the conversations going on in the country by having Treasury officials out there, uh, they, could, uh, they could get that more on the, uh, on the radar screen in the dialogue in Saudi Arabia, whereas before that, quite frankly, uh, the conversations weren't about that in Saudi Arabia, and here I was, uh, and w with Juan and others at the Treasury Department, focused entirely on the, on the financing side, and there was a lot of cooperation going on on other issues, on other counterterrorism issues uh, that were important. Uh, I do think that uh, now they're, they're much more proactive. It's not that the problem is over, but they're much more proactive, a much better partner, uh, and are taking very seriously the, the, the issue of money going out of Saudi Arabia, starting to hold people accountable, uh, which is something that we had been uh, urging them to do for a long time. Now they have started to do that, holding people accountable uh, for terrorist financing. And as a result, we have seen the facilitation networks to the extent they still exist, as Juan just mentioned, uh, not so much in Saudi Arabia as in Kuwait and Qatar. Which I know is something both of you feel strongly about, um, Stuart very passionately about uh, other places. Um, let, let's take Kuwait, because uh, when you raised this issue to me eight months ago, I, 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 it was really shocking, um, coming off a couple of the years where Kuwait was some of the biggest buyer of, of Patriot missiles, and you, you would think that the U.S., uh, by virtue of that, as well as other things, would have quite a bit of leverage over Kuwait, and yet... Uh, there was still no law in the books. There is still no law in the books that makes it illegal to give money to terrorists. So why is it that we don't use a leverage? Do we not have a leverage? What is the compromise that we are, that we are making in allowing that to happen? Um, you know, I, 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 I think it's, uh, you know, as an American official, I think over time you come to be a little bit more modest in thinking, you know, why do we allow it to happen? Uh, you know, it's, we don't control Kuwait. But I do think that... Uh, if I look back on kind of the public attention on terrorist financing, which you know, at times has been very high, uh, a, a matter of real public concern, the focus is always Saudi Arabia. And, uh, and so now when I, when I see the, the facilitation going on in Kuwait and Qatar and see even, you know, uh, I, can, I can sense it because I can see in the Treasury Department's public statements even last week how they tried to highlight that these, these networks were in Kuwait and Qatar, uh, trying to make, put that into the public domain, I think in part to put pressure, uh, that I, I think that's, that's what we can do. And it's, it really is still shocking to me that uh, we would go to Kuwait a lot and say, you know, here are facilitators that we'd like you to take care of. Uh, they'd say, well, we tried to prosecute them, but uh, we couldn't get them sentenced to more than a few months or we couldn't get them convicted. And of course the problem was the things that they were doing didn't violate their criminal law, which uh, is a viol that, that in itself, not having a law to criminalize terrorism financing, is a violation of kind of international standards of, uh, on financial controls. So I think we have to keep pushing very hard, and m maybe bringing more public attention to it is is a useful step. But how do you? I mean, the, the things you're balancing here, and I, and I, I mean, I take your point. The way I phrase it was, was was not right. I mean, we don't allow it; they control themselves. But we do control um, coordination of our own policy, right? If they're doing that and we don't like it, then why is uh, then why are we selling all of uh, all of those patriots, and why are we? You know, it doesn't seem coordinated across the U.S. government. Well, don't assume that us selling them patriots is. I mean, that's in our interest too. I mean, so right. Uh, the, it, you have to look and see what what really is your leverage here, uh, and you know they are cooperating with us on a number of very very important issues, and this is one which has tremendous political sensitivity in Kuwait. So. Just as an example, one of the things that uh, Juan and I did when we were in the government was that we designated for terrorism uh, the, a, a major charity in Kuwait that has a lot of very senior people uh, who are you know, affiliated with the charity and on the board of the charity. But we couldn't get the, the terrorist financing going through that charity to stop, and we finally did take public action. Well, we, you know, we have to overcome that kind of tension that that kind of thing creates, even though we decided that it was worth doing in order to cut off the money going through it. I think Stuart's earlier comments absolutely right in terms of you know, how terrorist financing fits into the broader diplomatic engagement. I mean, financial diplomacy is part of a, a broader engagement. And I think when it comes to the Gulf countries, uh, we clearly saw this with Saudi, but it's the case with Kuwait and I think uh, as well with Qatar, um, there are political balances and sensitivities internally to how the countries want to deal with these issues. I mean, I, I would say that the slog that we had to go through with the Saudis 
Uh, and I remember the trip I took with Secretary O'Neill in March of 2002 to Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and other Gulf countries to deal with these issues. And we were talking to the Saudis about shutting down al Haramain, which was the biggest Islamic charity uh, in Saudi Arabia that had ties to al-Qaeda. And so that was a very contentious, difficult set of negotiations that literally took years to see kind of full implementation of. But I think the reality, especially in Saudi, was that you not only had these cultural issues where you know, we wanted very quick action, very direct cutoff of, of financing, very public actions, people being held accountable, and Stuart was one of the most critical and important voices on that. Um, while they had a different approach, and they wanted to handle it quietly, softly, behind the scenes. In Saudi Arabia, though, I think there are two other fundamental things that, that we still have to keep an eye on. First, out of Saudi Arabia had come the financing for the Arab Mujahideen and the Afghan Mujahideen movement. And so they, in many ways, were the financial uh, infrastructure that had provided it for that movement. In many ways, that was the same structure and networks that were being used pre-9-11 and even post-9-11. And so you had to kind of have them retreat from accepting that framework as a, a legitimate framework, just as we did with Pakistan, for example, when uh, Deputy Secretary Armitage went out and, and had his discussions with uh, President Musharraf. This was the financial version of that. Secondly, and this, I think, still remains an issue, the Saudis have always uh, been uh, proponents of funding Wahhabi ideology and causes abroad. And so if you look at Central Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, Africa, the mosques, the cultural centers, the big ones, the attractive ones, are funded by the Saudis uh, with a particular ideological bent. Now, in and of itself, the Salafi, Wahhabi ideology isn't uh, sort of inherently antithetical to U.S. national security interests, but the reality is that there's a very close relationship between that ideology and some of the support networks that al-Qaeda has leveraged in the past. And so that network and that sort of um, proselytization of Wahhabi ideology has been fundamental to the Saudi sort of policy and has always been at the core of trying to get them to help on terrorist financing. So I think all of those sensitivities still are at play in the Gulf. Uh, but, and, but let me just commend Stuart, uh, and Steve Hadley, and a number of folks who are in this room who, who you know, were dogged on these issues and put these issues at the top of the agenda uh, even when folks thought we weren't pushing them, we were very hard. And I think uh, a lot of the, the positive news that Stuart's reflecting uh, is a reflection of that work. Did you feel like you had to fight against the apparatus of the U.S. intelligence system uh, from the perspective of when you're looking at, at stopping these flows? I mean, I understand it's a, it's a series of compromises, but you're, in, in a sense, one of the newer organizations involved with the dog in the fight. Um, no, I, I honestly don't think that. I think that, uh, you know, the intelligence community wanted to fight terrorism in all ways. I do think, as I was trying to allude to before, that um, you know, when you got out in the field to Riyadh where people were frankly working operational issues that were really serious day to day, it was unreasonable to assume that they were going to be uh, prioritizing the kinds of issues that we're talking about here because these are more long-term systemic issues. And, uh, and that's why I think it was important you know for us to continue to raise them from Washington and for us to keep going out there and raising them and for us to raise them at a high political level and for us to send people out, uh, uh, both you know, the, having people in Riyadh uh, not only is useful in dealing with the Saudis, it's useful for dealing with everybody else in the embassy because it, it helps to uh, prioritize that issue. Um, if I could just pick up on one, one other point that Juan made uh, about the uh, Saudi determination to fund Wahhabism uh, abroad. You know, when I think about what our challenges are going forward, uh, you know, if we're going to really dissuade people from giving money to, to, to terrorism, you can deter some, uh, and you know, terrorist financing is the one place on the counterterrorism spectrum where deterrence has a chance of working because these guys don't want to be exposed as being terrorist financiers because they want to live in polite society. You're not going to deter the operatives, obviously. But for dissuasion, it, it is a large part what is being taught in schools. And you know, I, I was really struck at the end of my service uh, you know, having a meeting with a, a high-level counterterrorism official from, from Saudi Arabia and, and raising the point that we, were, you know, we had a long discussion, people talking about the operatives that we were worried about. And I, and I said to him, you know, the people that we were talking about uh, during this meeting were like 14 or 15 years old on 9-11. Um, that means 
that we have our work still cut out for us because we're, you know, that, that you know, the whole, you know, we, we kept talking about we don't want to create a new pipeline of these guys. Now, you were never going to be completely successful, and I don't think you should hold the fact that there are new operatives as a sign of failure, but it does mean we should think about it. We should think about not just de-radicalization or, you know, reform of people who have uh, gone astray, but, you know, getting, uh, getting in earlier and what we're teaching young people, and that's something which, you know, we can try as hard as we want as a U.S. government. It's not something that we're really well positioned to do in the Muslim world. And I was just going to say, I think one of the things that uh, proved valuable over time, and it, and it took some time, was demonstrating even within the government the value of sort of the terrorist financing campaign itself in right. the larger uh, scheme of things. I think Jose, Kofer, and others who, John Pistol, who were part of this can attest to it, that I think there wasn't necessarily an appreciation for the power of the tools that we were talking about, the, the ability to use, for example, uh, asset freezes, to name and shame and to financially isolate rogue actors, especially those who are businessmen who have one foot in the legitimate world, one foot in the jihadi support world, to actually isolate them. And I think one of the, one of the great uh, evolutions over the past 10 years, and Stuart really spearheaded this with, with the office that he created, is the idea that you actually rely on the private sector in many ways, to do the isolating for you. I mean, I, I would say that Stewart's engagement over the last couple of years was probably more with bank CEOs and board members than it was with uh, government counterparts. And in fact, probably more valuable. Mm -hmm. Because the idea there is that the private sector, the legitimate banks of the world, don't want to be financing terrorism, don't want to be financing illicit uh, activity, uh, and certainly don't want to see their name uh, in one of your reports or in Wall Street <laughs> Journal or something. <laughs> Uh, as being a subject to regulatory action or an asset freeze. And so that model became very important. The other thing I think proved valuable was, in some ways, uh, you know, terrorist financing was, as I call it, sort of the camel's uh, nose under the tent. It was a way of getting at some of these fundamental issues. One of the best uh, analogies. Well, <laughs> well on, on, on the Saudi issue, for example, the, the whole question of how the Saudis were financing, even after they had the Riyadh bombings in May of 03, how the financing abroad was affecting terrorism, you know, that discussion, debate was ha being had through the lens of terrorist financing. And even this past week with the designations that seem to suggest there's some facilitation being allowed by the Iranians uh, and defining the relationship between Iran and al-Qaeda, that very fundamental and important question of is there a relationship between Iran and al-Qaeda is being had through the terrorist financing lens. And so I think over time, uh, the entire counterterrorism community, the national security community, realized that this terrorist financing campaign, which was the province of some treasury officials uh, you know, in some corner over there, actually was valuable from a national security perspective and to get at some of these harder issues. I want to get to a rant. For those of you who don't know, I know everyone here spends so much time in the Middle East, but I think it goes, once the camel gets his nose under the tent, the rest of his body soon will follow. The, uh, <laughs> just kind of a neat image. Anyway, um, I, before we get to Iran, which I know you want to talk about, I know there's a lot of questions about that from the audience too. Um, I, I wanted to ask you just because of some of the, obviously the story this week about uh, the, the man who didn't want to serve in Afghanistan and was planning attack on Fort Hood, the prior attack on Fort Hood, Times Square. Um, mix of different situations, different financing, different uh, inspirations there. Um, but obviously, U.S. born and bred in many ways. And, and there's been a lot of uh, reports. I mean, I've seen quite a, a few in the New York Times on al-Shabaab and domestic or U.S. financing for al-Shabaab. So we talk a lot about Gulf funding here, but I'm curious as to funding emanating from the United States. And, and I guess two questions. One, how significant is it? And two, can you trace it? Um, well, rather than take it as you know, uh, particular incidents, I, I think it is useful to look at where we were pre, you know, where we've come on this issue. And I think if you look back prior to 9/11, uh, the United States was a huge terrorist financing uh, node, uh, mostly for Hamas, but also for Hezbollah and Al Qaeda and so forth. And what we had uh, in the intervening time is a tremendous uh, uh, effort led by the FBI and the Justice Department to really go after this. And we did, you know, I, I mentioned before creating deterrence. The one country where there's really deterrence on terrorist financing, I think, is in the United States. Uh, we have very tough sentences. I mean, some that even surprise me when I, when I read about them in Texas with, you know, 60 years, years or, or so for terrorist financing. The FBI has been very, very aggressive in, bring, in, in investigating these cases and, and creating deterrence. So in general, 
we've made this a much tougher target for terrorist financing. That doesn't mean that it doesn't ever occur, and I think Al-Shabaab is an example of uh, a challenge that we have where you have a, uh, uh, an expatriate community that, you know, uh, on the one hand wants to send back remittances, uh, which are totally legitimate and necessary, and, you know, we've got a real humanitarian issue there. On the other hand, uh, you have to be careful about whether uh, some of it is going uh, for the wrong reasons. And then you have your individuals that are self-motivated, and frankly, that is, you know, a, a problem that is much, much harder than you can solve with the kind of uh, uh, terrorist financing uh, tools that we've been, we've been talking about. I think where things are evolving, I think Stuart's right. The, the lone wolf, uh, the singular actors become very hard. It's hard from a counterterrorism perspective generally to get at them. It's hard from a, a you know, counterterrorist financing perspective as well. If there's a network, if there's a collusion and movements of, of funds, especially transnationally, much easier. Um, I think actually one of the interesting advantages we have um, moving forward is the fact that you do have this fragmented financing occurring. And you've got groups like Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb, the North African group, uh, engaged in uh, you know, ransom, hostage taking, and ransom uh, financing, in essence. Um, you have AQIM as well, the same group engaged in drug trafficking. Uh, the DEA has now indicted a couple of those individuals with respect to the drug trade from South America through West Africa into Europe. Um, and there are other examples as well. So, uh, if you look at it, the way that Al-Qaeda and, and related groups, to the extent that they're organized, are actually financing themselves, they make themselves more vulnerable. Um, and in fact, just this last week, Al-Qaeda in Iraq put out a, a desperate message online asking for funds for widows and orphans because they're really hurting. And we know in the past that they've used oil smuggling, bank robberies, uh, extortion to actually fund their operations. And so that in many ways provides opportunities because it's more localized. Uh, local authorities know how to deal with that a little bit better. Uh, and it's uh, more palatable politically to actu actually go after bank robbers, drug traffickers, uh, and common criminals and thieves. It delegitimizes them. Right. It delegitimizes them. If they're raising money by engaging in crime, it plays into our broader narrative about you know, who are these guys really and do you really want to support them? And that's especially true when you think about all the things Juan's talking about. Um, which it brings me to Iran because uh, obviously there's a lot of a lot of questions on that. Um, let, let, let's, I guess, start off with the big picture, which is that um, you both uh, worked under President Bush, and Stuart obviously worked under President Obama as well. And I know it's come up uh, about the differences in, in policy and President Obama's decision to uh, to try to engage. Uh, I know you both feel a little bit differently on whether that was something that was a good idea, and also perhaps what its longer term repercussions are. So, Stuart, first of all, if you could make the case for why you think it was it made sense to try that, and then Juan, I know, has a different point of view. Well. I, I guess I, I, I don't, I don't want to approach it as trying to defend the, the, the president's decision to engage. Uh, that is a decision he, you know, he, he made clear during the campaign he was going to engage. Uh, and so it became a question, and, and so that was not a debate uh, once the administration started. He, he promised in the campaign he was going to engage. So then it became a question of how do we do this? And <laughs> how long will this engagement take? And I think that's really what, in, in, in retrospect, uh, I think the engagement, both the engagement took longer and the, as, as we said in the administration, the pivot to pressure uh, took much longer than we had hoped for. Uh, I think it would have surprised the incoming administration if you had told them that it would take them, uh, that Iran would, had, would totally reject their effort at engagement, but that you wouldn't be able to get uh, a new Security Council resolution on Iran until June of 2010. They would have said, oh, that's ridiculous. We, we can do it much faster than that. But those of you who have you know, been through these kinds of big dip, uh, diplomatic lifts, it's not that much of a, uh, of a surprise. The, uh, the, the one, um, uh, as we go forward, I would say the one advantage or the one kind of silver lining of that uh, delay uh, is the uh, the assistance it gave us when we went to countries that were, that were uh, fairly uh, unsympathetic to our Iran policy. Uh, and they would say, look, it's not going to work. You're going to need to engage them. Uh, you need, it, it won't work through pressure. And finally, we were able to say, look, we tried that. Uh, now, you know, the, the, the president tried that. He took a lot of political heat in the United States for trying it. Uh, he was uh, criticized for being naive uh, at home. But he put his prestige on the line to engage on the theory that if Iran rejected us, that we would turn and put significant pressure on them. Now we need you to be with us. 
And uh, I said pretty much that sentence in you know, dozens of capitals around the world uh, once we did start to uh, uh, push for pressure. And you, know, you, can never, you don't get to do it over with, you know, uh, with a different, um, uh, you know, different set of facts, but I do think that we were quite successful once we did start turning to pressure at getting a broad uh, coalition of countries to not just uh, go along with putting pressure on them, but to actually take the Security Council resolution and uh, implement it very, very aggressively. Now, we, uh, we can talk later about what more needs to be done, but at least that step of the diplomacy, I think, worked pretty well. I, I think that delay uh, and the pause, I would call it a pause in the financial pressure that we had really started in late 05, 06, and Stuart had spearheaded, um, was a strategic mistake, a, a major strategic mistake. Because I think on these issues, time and timing matter. Um, and I think um, a, f a few things. We had momentum in terms of financial pressure and largely driven through the private sector reactions to Iranian behavior. And frankly, uh, as we look at this pressure campaign, Iran's uh, willingness to sort of help us along with uh, greater control of the economy, for example, uh, by the Revolutionary Guard Corps, which makes it a lot easier for steward and treasury officials to go into a, a bank like UBS and Credit Suisse and say, do you really want to be doing business with the people who are engaged in, the, in not only the intelligence apparatus of, of this regime, but also their nuclear program? So there was already that momentum, and it was actually working. And I think that that strategic pause was a mistake, in part because I don't think it was an either-or. I think the administration could have said, we're going to re-energize engagement. And by the way, I think the French, the British, and the Germans were surprised that we were saying in the new administration that we hadn't been engaging because we had, there were offers on the table. In fact, offers that were memorialized in the, the UN sanctions resolutions that we had passed. Um, and so I, I think that, that pause was, was a mistake. Another reason it's important is the reason these measures have worked and why they're different than traditional trade-based sanctions that we've you know, seen in the 80s and 90s is we're making an argument about the environment, the fact that the Iranians are not trustworthy, that they're engaged in particular types of conduct that are unacceptable, and frankly that are um, somewhat divorced from the political and diplomatic process. These are, these are things that are bad in and of themselves for the international financial system. And so to pause all of a sudden in that campaign, you're, you're in essence conceding that your policy is driven by politics and not the substance of the, that environment. The, the last thing I would say is, again, time and timing matters because right as we were sort of in the middle of this engagement, uh, or so-called engagement, or attempted at engagement, uh, you had the Green Movement, which really was, I think, I mean, the Persian Spring was the start of the Arab Spring. And I think our inability to see the totality of the types of pressure and strategic uh, nodes that were important to changing Iran's behavior uh, were missed. And part of that was we had this either or very linear mentality to the strategy. And part of that had to do with the fact that we would put this pressure campaign on pause. And the, the, I guess the final thing I would say, I'm passionate about this. Um, you know, I'm not sure who we were trying to convince. Because amidst the Iranian rejections of the entreaties and the, and the engagement, we were also watching very closely the secret site at Qom. Uh, which we later revealed because the Iranians understood that we knew what they were doing. And so uh, while we were doing this, while we had the strategic pause on the financial pressure, we knew all along that they were engaged in surreptitious and potentially problematic activity that ultimately would be a turning point in terms of how uh, countries were willing to engage. And so I think that was a strategic mistake. And again, I think it points again to the importance of financial pressure as part of a national security uh, perspective uh, that, that's very important to have squarely in mind. So you're, you're known as someone and, and devoted to uh, dealing with sanctions, tirelessly fighting for it. I mean, we've, we've all seen that. Um, and, and I, and it, but I put you on the spot a little bit here. I know that I'm Michael Iskop, but talked to John McLaughlin, who said uh, that at best the Iran sanctions were working a little bit. And um, I know we've joked, I, I was in uh, Iran in December, and GM and Ford vehicles were easily available. The newest Dodge Charger was bragged about by concierge is available for rent. And that was just, I mean, iPhones, everything was there. Um, and, and I know it's, I mean, I guess the, the silver lining is the Iranian people want American products. And that's not necessarily a bad thing in one sense. But in all seriousness, um, 
what could we do more? I mean, is this just as simple as China and oil, or what could we do more to make the sanctions effective? Right. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to come up here and, you know, after spending uh, five years of my life trying to pressure Iran and, and start to argue against pressure, so I'll just, I'm just going to leave Juan's <laughs> uh, views uh, and, and answer your question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> by the way, by the way, I, I thought they should have unleashed Stewart sooner. <laughs> um, I do think that we, you know, and, and as I said in my earlier answer, we are in a, 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 a reasonably good position to escalate dramatically. And I do think we will need to escalate dramatically to have the kind of uh, outcome on Iran that, that we're, we're looking for. And it may not work, but we have the ability to escalate dramatically. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Juan mentioned the IRGC, one thing that we have now persuaded the world of is that the IRGC is an illicit organization. Iran is using the IRGC across its economy, okay? So we have built the groundwork for essentially putting tremendous pressure on their entire economy just working through the IRGC because the IRGC is involved in its energy uh, industry. Uh, the, the Treasury has already pointed out how the IRGC is involved in its major port operations. You can see how it could really get at uh, the... Um, uh, the entire economy uh, in Iran. And we have kind of laid the groundwork for, uh, for doing that. The other thing that's happened, uh, I know this is um, not uh, going to be as simple a step as, as I'm going to uh, lay it out uh, as, but we saw the United Nations impose sanctions on Libya that are exactly the kind of sanctions that we will need on Iran. And they did it uh, with almost no debate. Uh, the debate was about the no-fly zone, okay? But the sanctions on Libya uh, uh, go to, they, they freeze the assets of the Central Bank of Libya, the entire government of Libya, the National Oil Company of Libya, uh, and we've, we, that, that's the kind of sanctions, or even the prospect of that kind of sanctions resolution uh, being debated at the United Nations would put uh, a lot of tension uh, in the debate in, in Iran. So I think we, we both have the ability to escalate the sanctions that already exist, and we've laid the groundwork uh, through the IRGC. And, and the IRGC is just one example that everyone's familiar with, but there are lots of other aspects to this, insurance companies, shipping companies, banks, et cetera. We've laid the groundwork where I think we have persuaded the world that this is an illicit actor and that, uh, as Juan put it, it's pretty easy to persuade the private sector that if you do business with them, you're going to run across these illicit actors. And, we're gonna, and there's an interorum effect there, too, which is we are now going to start exposing that. And uh, the private sector doesn't want to be on the wrong side of that. But uh, it's going to be hard. I think what the international community has shown up until now is that uh, the Iran issue, they know it's a big threat. It's kind of looming out there. But nobody knows exactly when it becomes, uh, it goes from being an important threat to an uh, urgent enough threat to do the kind of thing that we did uh, with respect to Libya. And in that sense, uh, you know, time does matter. So two, two, two questions from that. One. Um, the, before I take the, the elephant in the room, which obviously is oil and, and China when it comes to Iran. But um, I, I know you and I have talked about this, but, but Samsung is just an example. And, and, and Samsung is everywhere in Iran. South Korean companies are everywhere, Hyundai's and, and every TV and open stores. And Samsung's very open about that. And when we called them, they were. Um, and right when, when, when we saw that, you know, we signed the big free trade agreement with South Korea. Um, and and I, I know this is, again, these, these kind of trade-offs that are made. But um, it does seem a little, uh, 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 it is a mixed message. It is perhaps hypocritical. How do you deal with that where you say, we want to hit you with a stick and, you know, we make banks choose between operating in the U.S. or Iran, but Samsung can do whatever the heck it wants? Well, I think that's a good question. But, but just so you know, the background here is that we don't have trade sanctions on Iran other than the United States. So the U.S. Security Council resolutions on Iran and the sanctions in every other country are not trade sanctions. So uh, without knowing the details, the fact that there are, uh, goods from other countries in Iran doesn't violate any of the UN sanctions. Uh, what we've done with South Korea and others is we've essentially persuaded them to go along with US-style sanctions on the financial side and on the IRGC. Mm -hmm. So after the uh, June 2010 resolution, uh, South Korea was one of many countries, Japan, all of the EU, et cetera, that said, uh, that, that took the list of banks that we had designated and said they would tell their banks to stop doing business with those banks. They uh, took all the list of the IRGC companies that we had designated and said, we're not going to let anyone do any business with the IRGC or any of these companies. That was not something that you could make the argument. I, I, I argue that that was called for by, by, the, by the resolution, but that was by no means obvious. Uh, and they certainly didn't think it was called for by the resolution. But they did it 
to cooperate with us, and they are dependent on Iran for oil still. So, uh, you know, are there South Korean products in Iran? Undoubtedly, but have they, you know, done more than is the bare minimum to uh, work with us on this? Yes, they have. And so hmm. the question is just, how, you know, every step of this has been, to use Juan's word, a slog, and we have, you know, it, hmm. we've got to put that kind of tremendous effort in uh, in my opinion, I think we've got to put that kind of tremendous effort in and that kind of political commitment into getting uh, the kind of escalation we need. I mean, it's just, will sanctions yeah. ever work? One, I mean, it, you know, well, there's skepticism about that. As long as they are the oil provider they are and the largest yeah. supplier to China, how does it ever work? It's a, it's a great question, but I think it, it bears mentioning and it's important strategically to try to understand what you're trying to achieve with your financial pressure. Uh, do you care so much if there are American cigarettes or chewing gum on the streets of Tehran? Um, maybe if you have a, a worldwide trade sanction uh, in place, yeah, that matters. But these financial pressure measures are intended to do several things. And I think part of, part of the confusion and the question of whether or not they're working uh, is based on sort of a maximalist sense of what they're supposed to achieve. They're supposed to be the magic bullet, right? We have, we've got this linear sense of, well, we tried engagement, so that's off the table. Now we're going to do sanctions, and that's supposed to change their behavior. If that doesn't work, then there's confrontation. It's a very linear approach, and that notion of a maximalist approach, I think, is distortive because the sanctions or the pressure campaign, better said, I, I call it financial suasion, is really intended to do several things. First, make it more complicated for their nuclear program to emerge. And so making it harder to get dual-use items in, for example, becomes important. Secondly, uh, isolating them uh, economically where it hurts and matters most. For example, the IRGC, Arisal, their shipping lines, et cetera. So what you then do with the shipping companies or with Lloyd's of London then matters quite a bit. Then questions of whether or not you can use this financial pressure to build fissures within the leadership. Uh, that then becomes a marker of success. And then finally, can you get them to change their behavior? Can you get them to come to the table where they're actually serious about putting the nuclear file you know, on the table for negotiation. That's the maximalist view. That's wonderful it happen, if it happens. But I don't think sanctions gets you to that final point. Sanctions and pressure gets you along the way, but there has to be a collection of other things that are happening to get that ultimate change of behavior. And so I think the question's a little bit distorted by our sense of, okay, what are these sanctions? Are they trade-based sanctions? Does it matter if you've got a Toyota vehicle on the streets of Tehran? Well, maybe. But it matters more if we're actually achieving our strategic goals through the use of financial pressure, and it's never going to be the silver bullet. Do you think that, I mean, when you look at this in, it, in, its, in its entirety, and obviously it's something you've spent a lot of time on, that, you know, we just have to accept the fact that they're going to move ahead on the nuclear program and that that we've done as much as we can do on the financial side, unless you get China on board and you get, you get a, real, a real ban on the National Oil Company? Well... I mean, I, I do think, as I said, that we, we, there's more we can do and that we, we, have a, we, we, we do have uh, a chance of getting to the right place on this. It's going to be hard. Uh, and you point out one of the big, you know, you, you, you take your, you know, uh, not to sound like Don Rumsfeld here, but, you know, this is, this is the adversary we've been given. You know, they're, they're floating in oil, right? So that's a challenge, okay? The rest of the world wants to buy their oil, including not just China. Okay, including South Korea and Japan and Italy and other countries. We have to figure out a way to do all the things that Juan's talking about, and I agree with, with everything Juan said about, uh, you know, th these sanctions are intended to do lots of different things, you know, create fissures in the leadership, uh, you know, start to, start to get people arguing with each other, slow down their nuclear program. That, that can all happen, and I think it, it has done that, but, you know, there are other things that we, we need to do. But uh, it's going to take um, prioritizing this in a, you know, in, in a, uh, at, the, at the highest levels to get the kind of hard things that we'll need. And, you and you're right, you're going to have to get uh, you know, deal with the fact that uh, uh, their, their ultimate safety valve is the fact that their, uh, their oil is still demanded by, by our allies. And you, made, you made an interesting point, though, when you were explaining just the simple math of it, that just slapping an embargo on the oil, if, that, if, if, if you were to assume that you could get that, that it may have the unintended consequences of raising world oil prices by so much that by selling significantly less, they're right, still right. making. So yeah, this is finances. not so simple. And you know, uh, um, you know, even if you hypothesize a, a complete trade, you know, a, 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 a create a complete refusal of uh, all these major customers to buy Iranian oil, at least overtly, 
okay? So, and then you assume, okay, you know, does someone else, does Saudi Arabia or others have spare capacity? They pump more, uh, you know, you can, they can replace some of this. There's questions about whether that's true, but does that kind of disruption raise the price uh, sufficiently that even if Iran uh, finds other customers and sells at a discount, you know, how much are they hurt? And so, it, you know, this is the kind of analysis that people have to do, and you know, it takes hard thinking. It's not, it's not as simple as just saying, well, let's just get another resolution and uh, you know, try to put trade sanctions on, on Iran. And frankly, you know, we haven't even mentioned what effect does that have on, uh, on, on our economy. Yeah. Aaron, you raise a great point, but I think in, in terms of looking at sort of the, the effects of the pressure campaign on their industrial capacity, that's important to look at as well because mm -hmm. Their desire to build more deep water ports, to modernize some of their oil exploration infrastructure, the South Pars field, uh, becomes important vulnerabilities as well in the context of a financial pressure warfare, war, warfare campaign. The converse is true as well because they rely very heavily on imported refined oil. And so pressuring that element of the market actually becomes important. And you've seen Sasada, the, the legislation that came out of Congress, sort of deal with that dimension of it and, and more calls for that to be a, a focus. And so I think there are ways of looking at the environment where it's not sort of, a, a, sort of a complete loss for the West, so to speak, in terms of trying to use the oil infrastructure as a tool against Iran. But ultimately, I, I agree, but ultimately we're going to need to, it need to have sufficient pressure on this regime in Iran that they think that, you know, in order for them to make anything other than kind of a tactical concession that's really just meant to buy time. You need to have sufficient pressure on them to think, look, our, our hold on, uh, our hold and control of this, of this society is at risk. And we have to do all the things that Juan said and all the things that, that you've mentioned, but it's, it, 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 I think the fundamental uh, question is that it, in order to do those things, we're going to have to make it an extraordinarily high priority for the United States because every one of those things is gonna be hard. I'm going to get to audience questions in, in a moment, but um, I did want to ask you when, I mean, it would seem, and, and obviously as not technologically a savvy person, but back in 9-11, in, in, in you were looking at, at financial flows, banks, large organizations, or it was flows like that. Now you have a proliferation of uh, online payment systems. Um, obviously, social media just as an entity has completely changed things, and I'm wondering if that has made your job easier because there's a, a more, more of a trail or much more difficult um, because the amounts are smaller and the players are more numerous? Um, look, if, it, if they were, I mean, I, I think it's a good news story that they're not able to just, you know, wire money through banks, uh, you know, easily. And so that might have been, it made the job of tracking it easier, but that was, a, that, that was you know, a bad, uh, that was a bad thing that they were able to do that. So uh, it's much, much more challenging uh, the way this money is now moved. Uh, it's uh, frankly, uh, uh, it's not even kind of in informal value transfer systems or hawalas that's used mostly. It's mostly just cash and people just taking cash and moving it. Now that makes it more challenging. On the other hand, you know when you have really good intelligence, like like we saw, uh, you know with the Bin Laden raid, where you do figure out who the couriers are, it gives you a tremendous opportunity, uh, and uh, you know. I, I like to joke that some, you know, if you, if you identify these couriers, sometimes they don't show up. You know, sometimes, it's, and it may be that sometimes they uh, uh, they get greedy, and uh, you know, you can and you can use that to create a lot of tension. We've seen lots of uh, situations where, you know, people start to accuse each other of uh, walking off with the money, and that uh, you know, then they start to talk about it, and you know, that that kind of thing is is, is useful. But uh, by and large, the their opsec is improving and uh, you know that's that's a challenge that we're just going to have to we we'll just have to deal with it I, I think one of the concerns that counterterrorism officials have expressed around the world is that that opsec from groups like al-qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is sort of exponentially improving I, I, I like to think of sort of the technological challenge being uh, volume speed and anonymity I mean it's the challenge that uh, intelligence counterterrorism officials have writ large but it's it's amplified in the financial context and if you look at the sort of the evolutionary leap toward the use of mobile banking, especially in developing economies. Currently, three quarters of uh, all mobile handsets are being used in the developing world. And that percentage is actually increasing over time. And so mobile banking will be 
I think at a certain point, uh, the replacement vehicle for the movement of money, especially in locales like Afghanistan and otherwise that haven't had access to formal financial systems, don't have access to ATMs, et cetera, the mobile system actually becomes uh, a, a method. That's a challenge. It's an opportunity mm -hmm. as well. So um, I think the landscape is constantly evolving, but uh, that's why you've got to have uh, folks uh, like Stuart and others who are dedicated to these issues looking at it all the time. All right, let's open up to audience questions. Good afternoon, Vale Oxford from the Tory Group. Uh, post 9-11, we had to create a lot of institutions and, and new approaches to dealing with the, the terrorism threat. And you, you mentioned a couple, and Stuart, your, clearly your successes, along with Juan, demonstrated a new, new tool that needs to be in our toolkit forever. Uh, you also mentioned that you were created by the Intelligence Reform Act. So based on the, the conversation today, uh, two, two questions. To what degree do you think your past successes were really a representative of the low-hanging fruit we just hadn't tried in the past? And separ separately from that, if that's not going to get harder, as you just suggested, how does this new int, if I can refer to that, get a fair seat at the table with the DNI, and we've had a lot of discussions on the DNI this week, to go against the traditional intelligence approaches and communities and get a fair shake to get the resources you may need? You know, I'm really glad you asked that because I, I, I wanted to say this. Um, the, uh, the Treasury Department benefited tremendously by the existence of the DNI because, you know, when the DNI would call together the 16 intelligence heads, I mean, so our Assistant Secretary for Intelligence was sitting next to the Director of the Central Intelligence Agency. That's elevation that she wasn't likely to get any other way. Uh, and. Uh, so that, that really helped us. And also, quite frankly, uh, we, uh, our intelligence office was a real startup. It started with like, it started with four analysts. Yeah. It started with four analysts, okay? So there were, law, you know, and, and it's interesting because there were low-hanging fruit that we could do with even four analysts. And th the one thing that, you know, those of you who work in government know, if you start to show you can get it done, then the money comes. And so we were able to grow because we were able to show value. And then once you're, you know, and then you can feed on that by, uh, you know, all of a sudden people, you know, were asking me, well, what information do you need? They probably had never asked anyone in the Treasury Department that in the history of the Treasury Department. You know, <laughs> you know all of a sudden, you know, the, the director of the NSA wants to, is, wants to say, well, how can we help? So that DNI, I mean, I guess, I don't know if it, maybe it would have worked without the DNI, but, but the DNI helped us tremendously, and it was partially uh, because of the personalities of the people there. David Shedd, who many of you know, Mike Leiter, who was uh, in the DNI's office when it first started and was a big supporter of what we were doing. Uh, and uh, uh, so that, that has been uh, the experience that we had. I would just add the fact that now the Assistant Secretary of Treasury for Intelligence Analysis, <laughs> Leslie Ireland, uh, who replaced Janice Gardner, is now the national uh, intelligence manager uh, for the DNI on threat finance. These issues across the community is really a, a graduation of that role and the importance uh, that, that the DNI, at least, ascribes to these issues. And if you look at the development of Finnant, I mean, there, you had the overt dimensions of, of what we did and sort of the gray zone of the SWIFT program, et cetera. You had the covert work and, and clandestine work that was happening across the intelligence community. You also had the military developing the concept of threat finance. So all of this is kind of the universe of financial intelligence that evolved over time. And as Stuart said, as people saw value to it, they wanted to contribute, they wanted to evolve, and now you have Treasury not only at the table uh, at the policy uh, making, but also in the intelligence community. Uh, Mitch Derman with I2. Um, yesterday there was a panel discussion on cyber and all the threats that that brings. Uh, it seems to me that the terror uh, networks, since they can't rely on traditional banking means, might be using cyber as a way uh, cyber fraud is a way to to, uh, to get the funding that they need. Are you seeing that? And is your department doing anything uh, as far as uh, on its own or with other agencies to combat that potential threat? I, I'm trying to think if I've seen examples of it. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't assume it's not happening. Uh, but a lot of the, you know, a lot of the money that's lost through cyber crime, you know, we don't, we don't know who's getting it. Uh, and, and, and as you know, um, and so uh, I think that it's one of those things where, uh, and there are a number of, of things that fall into this category, like we need to protect ourselves from cyber uh, attacks and cyber criminals 
full stop. I mean, the fact that it might also be a counterterrorism uh, uh, vulnerability is one of the reasons, but it's, it's not the only one. And I, uh, I don't know that, uh, you know, I don't know whether there's a factual predicate for saying it's a terrorist financing vulnerability, it's, but it's, it's just a vulnerability. If I just add, I think one of the interesting questions is how much does the terrorist financing threat and terrorist groups, however they're constituted, uh, meld with other organizations or cells and, and activists. You know, one of the things I think we need to watch is does the sort of the hacktivist trend uh, online start to then uh, permeate into terrorist organizations and then start to permeate in terms of fundraising. So I think those nexuses uh, between organizations become very important and you may start to see it first in the cyber domain. Okay. Thank you. College. Uh, if I uh, can redirect your attention to North Korea for a second and, and uh, talk to Stuart in particular. Uh, I'm wondering if you think our sanctions policy towards North Korea has been consistent over time. Uh, the reason I ask is uh, because it seems that uh, when we're mad at the North Koreans, we slap on sanctions, we ratchet up the pressure. Uh, but then the North Koreans wink at us, they suggest it's time for engagement, and we appear then to relax our efforts. And I'm thinking in particular of the Banco Delta Asia case. So. Uh, do we have a consistent sanctions policy against North Korea? And this may be particularly relevant these days because it appears as if we're going to be getting back together with the North Koreans uh, sometime soon. Um, look, I, I don't think anyone could, could look at our North Korea policy from 2005 to 2011 across two presidents uh, and say it's been you know, a consistent uh, policy on sanctions. I mean, there have been times where we've focused more attention on putting pressure and times where we haven't. That's you know, to be candid, that's going to happen, you know, because, y you know, I agree with what Juan said about Iran, that you need to, you know, keep focusing on the conduct and keep pursuing it uh, consistently. But in terms of what's prioritized and what public messaging is going to go out, I think there's always going to be a, di a diplomatic uh, um, component to it. Now, you allude to, you know, a big decision that we made in the Bush administration where we did have a tremendous amount of pressure applied to North Korea because of an action that we took on a bank in Macau. Uh, and ultimately, uh, we made a decision to, um, to uh, you know, ease that off in exchange for, for promises uh, that the North Koreans ultimately didn't keep. That's, you know, from my perspective, uh, even though that didn't turn out how we hoped, I would say that was, uh, that, that fit into the mission that I felt I had at the Treasury Department, which was try to create options uh, to help the president uh, uh, pursue you know, uh, the national security agenda. And I think that you know, we certainly uh, created options in that situation. And you know, hindsight is always 20-20, uh, <coughs> but uh, we were able to create a lot of pressure on North Korea uh, through, that, uh, through that tool. And perhaps we could uh, we could we could do it uh, again if it was deemed necessary. Aaron, can I just yeah. make, raise yeah. a, because this is a very important point. I, I think this raises a fundamental question and issue with respect to these new brand of financial pressure uh, and campaigns, because it, it's often described as being part of coercive diplomacy, or at least an aspect of it. But there's a divergence from diplomacy uh, between this particular type of financial pressure and diplomacy. And the Banco Delta Asia case is a perfect example. We may come across that case again with Iran, for example. Uh, where they continue to do the things that we think we should be isolated from the international financial system, but we want to bring them back to the table. And so we may take steps that are antithetical to the financial pressure campaign, but are important to the diplomacy. And as Stuart said, those are just trade-offs that you have to make, but I think we have to be conscious that it is an, it is an actual trade-off. Uh, and I think that's uh, a lesson that everyone has learned over time. I think we know there are trade-offs, and of course those, are, those kinds of things get, as you might imagine, get debated at you know, intensely behind closed doors, as they should be. All the way in the back. Thank you. Massimo Calabresi from Time. Uh, it seems to me that there is a diminishing credibility to the sanctions uh, in Iran. Uh, the longer they accumulate low enriched uranium, uh, the less sanctions appear to be changing their behavior. Uh, the less effective the sanctions uh, overall uh, become. So my question is, how long do you think you have 
uh, we have um, with economic sanctions to change Iranian behavior? At what point uh, do they simply lose credibility? I, I, I guess I'd... Uh, he wants a date. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll push back a little bit on the, uh, on the question because I don't think that just because they're continuing to enrich uranium that the sanctions are losing credibility. The question of whether the sanctions have credibility is whether they're, they're applying the pressure that, and that they, they're meeting the objectives, you know, all the different objectives that Juan laid out earlier, but also, you know, what is the prospect that they will achieve their, their goal? And uh, if we have a, re a revitalization of the sanctions effort, I think, you know, the fact that, that uh, we, we've laid this groundwork will be useful. I do think that the question of how much longer we have is a, look, this is the ultimate, this is a, a very tough question, and it's also put us in a very tough spot over time because what's happened is there's been lots of discussion at various times, this is the year. You know, we've got to get it done this year. This is, if we don't get it by, done by this year, they're going to get breakout capacity, et cetera. Frankly, we, we have, uh, you know, a close ally, Israel, that also, you know, raises this specter of, okay, this is the key year, we've got to solve it this year, and that becomes part of the public debate as well. And I think that because we've been able to slow it down, a sanction success in part, uh, and push the timeline uh, to, to the right, we, have, we, we haven't been able to get the international community to, you know, decide that this is the time that we've got to treat it as urgently as, you know, ironically, the Libya problem. And, and do the kinds of tough things that we did on Libya uh, on the sanction side uh, on Iran. And the fact that this is a, uh, uh, an obscure intelligence question, I mean, that's true even if you got to read all the intelligence, frankly, uh, is uh, it makes this a harder thing to do. And we have to decide that, you know, uh, in some ways, uh, we have to decide this is the time we're going to escalate. Can I just say one quick thing? I think the question of timing gets um, complicated by the recent Treasury action, uh, the designation of this Al-Qaeda-sponsored uh, network through Iran, uh, because it very much raises the question of, again, what is the relationship between Iran and Al-Qaeda? And if you're talking about a, a threat of Iran developing nuclear weapons, then theoretically you have the question of a state sponsor developing uh, nuclear weapons that has some sort of relationship with Al Qaeda. Um, whether or not that's true or not, how much fidelity there is to that, that, that's a separate question. But it certainly raises the diplomatic and political question squarely and adds, I think, urgency to the question of whether or not financial pressure can slow the clock. Yeah. Uh, perfect timing. Dina Temple Raston with National Public Radio. I wanted to ask you about that, that very story. One, you've said several times that time and uh, timing matters. So I'm wondering why has this Iranian tie and the specific guy that you've been following for eight years funneling cash to Al-Qaeda, why is this story coming out now? Why is he being outed now? And there's just something bigger going on. And Stuart, for you, you know, w one of your quotes has been, we need to escalate this dramatically. Is, is this story an example of that, except it's escalating dramatically through the media? I can't answer for the administration why they came out now with this, but you know I do find it interesting, sort of putting my CBS News analyst hat on now, um, that you've had tougher talk with respect to Iran over the last couple of weeks, and so um, I wonder if it's part of a, a, a strategy to demonstrate to Iran that we're willing to bite, uh, and you can bite in different ways, and making something like this public is a way of, of pressuring uh, differently. So I'm just not sure. Uh, Dina, but I think we were always, um, and I think you know, analysts on the outside and the inside always wondered and have wondered what that relationship between Al Qaeda and Iran has been because they're, they're mortal enemies at the end of the day, uh, but they make common cause against the United States and there's a triangular relationship there uh, that, that they may be taking advantage of. And so I think it becomes an incredibly important question now, especially that that link is now public, it's alleged by the Treasury Department in, in the official uh, action. Uh, and I think that's going to become a subject of much debate. We'll see how Iran responds, but I think it adds complications to the diplomacy. Um, yes. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I do think that uh, uh, the messaging that, came, that accompanied this 
uh, action by the Treasury Department where they were very strong on saying there was a deal between Iran and Al-Qaeda is part of an, of an escalation strategy. Uh, much, you know, we, we did the same thing by, we, we thought long and hard about exposing Iran's support for the Taliban, uh, which also falls in the same category, you know, not ideologically. Uh, uh, the, the one thing they share with the Taliban is a hatred of the United States, uh, but other than that, not much. Yet, we, we, we did decide, uh, you know, okay, we're gonna expose this as part of that, uh, that, that same uh, sentiment. All right, one more. Go ahead, David. Hi, uh, David Cole from Georgetown. Um, I wanted to raise a question about the fairness of this um, tool, which is clearly a powerful tool, but I think the, f the fairness questions are serious, and I think they're relevant ultimately to its effectiveness, um, sort of long-term and worldwide. So, and I think there's two sets of fairness issues. One is the breadth of the definition of what can put you on the list. Uh, if you provide any service to an entity that's on the list, you can be put on the list, which means you can have your assets frozen, et cetera, including speech, including coordinated advocacy. So when Fran Townsend, uh, Michael Mukasey, Tom Ridge, and Rudy Giuliani spoke out at a Paris conference organized by the MEK in support of the MEK getting taken off the list, when they signed a New York Times ad with an MEK uh, person supporting MEK uh, getting off the list, they, were in, they are, technically subject to being sub, um, for having their assets frozen, yet no action was taken against them. Um, uh, the second um, fairness issue is the procedures that are used to put entities on the list or individuals on the list. So, uh, and I, I don't know how, how familiar people are with that, but um, any entity or individual in the United States is potentially subject to this. So Aspen Institute tomorrow could be shut down by the Treasury Department, all it would take is the Treasury Department to write a letter saying we're investigating you for s providing support through speech. They wouldn't even have to say, we didn't even have to say what they're investigating for. We're investigating you for potential designation uh, as a terrorist organization. That requires no finding of wrongdoing, no going to a court. Your, your, your assets are then frozen. Uh, you're not told what the charges are against you. Your offices are, and I, I, I speak because I represent, I've represented several organizations have had this happen to them. Your offices, everything in your office is taken from you, uh, so you don't even have access to your records to defend yourself. You ask, what's the basis for the investigation? What's the basis for the charge? The government doesn't tell you. They then at some point provide the public administrative record that they're relying on, but not any classified information that they're relying on. And they don't tell you in the public administrative record what it's related to. So you, 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 the Aspen Institute could get a list of, uh, could get 100 documents with all kinds of organizations and individuals uh, named, but no evident link to Aspen Institute. And Aspen Institute would have to guess as to what the connections might be. Then you're, when you're frozen, there's no statement of reasons as to why um, you're frozen. Uh, and the government can rely on secret evidence to do this. Uh, and, and, and show it to a court behind closed doors without providing any summary to the entity. Now, this is a procedure which I think, you know, I think most of us would say is un-American. Uh, two federal courts have, have held as unconstitutional, and yet there's been no move within the, um, within the Treasury Department, uh, either under the Bush administration or under the Obama administration, to improve these procedures. And it's not just our courts that have called them into question. The same, the same problems exist with the UN Security Council's uh, designation process, which we essentially got them to adopt and modeled on ours. Uh, and that process has been held inconsistent with the European Constitution and the, uh, and the U UK, um, uh, the Supreme Court, under the European Convention on Human Rights, which then means that they're not enforceable in Europe. So do, does it need to be so broad? Sorry for the long question, but I wanted to lay the foundation. Does it need to be so broad in terms of the s criminalizing speech? And secondly, it, why, n why not provide more uh, fair processes when you're, when you're shutting down an entity indefinitely? Um, well, let, you know, that's, it is a long question. Let me just uh, say a couple things. I'll surprise you with the first thing I say, which is these authorities are dramatic. And there are a lot of times where I, I was in meetings and I, you know, and I raised concerns about using authorities in certain contexts because I said, look, 
ultimately these are, these are congressionally granted authorities and if we overreach uh, and you know, start designating the Aspen Institute because we, you know, then they'll be taken away. And so we have to use these uh, carefully and make sure we're right and, you know, but I understand that's a trust us answer, but, you know, at least the people who have the jobs should, be, should do everything they can to be worthy of trust, even if trust us is not a good enough answer. Secondly, uh, you were careful in the way you phrased the question to put the first half of the question in terms of fairness instead of legality because the Supreme Court ruled that it was legal. Uh, so then you're in a situation of, you know, if we go back to your, your discussion this morning, we know it's in the box. Or the Supreme Court says it's in the box. So then it's a question of when do we use it, but we know because the Supreme Court said it's in the box. Uh, the questions, the, 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 the places where there have been uh, rulings by courts uh, are, uh, are in the, the procedural aspects that you, you, you talk about. I do think that uh, you raise good points uh, about some of them. And, and uh, you know, you'll notice that uh, this ability to do this during the pendency of an investigation is a power that is uh, not often used anymore, I think, because those of us who saw uh, that power being used and the, the, the questions it raised uh, thought, you know, that's, that's something we should be much more modest about. But uh, you know, I think that in some ways the system is working. You know, we have these powers. We try to use them responsibly. Uh, people who uh, are aggrieved can, can challenge them in court, and then we, we, we can adjust uh, based on uh, the court's rulings. It's not true that we don't ever adjust unless we're told by court that we must. Uh, you know, we, as we were chatting about last night, uh, I quickly said, look, uh, th th these people want uh, attorney's fees uh, to be paid. Uh, they want to hire David Cole. Fine, uh, give them a license to to uh, to hire an attorney and, uh, and and to pay an attorney because I think that that's fair uh, and that's what they should have. Uh, but uh, I, I do think that um, uh, as the process is, is is playing out in in some ways the way it should in our system. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks again, Clark. Can't we appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. We'll reconvene at 3 o'clock.